So welcome to uh, the third information session on Ground Story or Histoire de Terrain, uh, a collective impact effort to address gentrification in the Greater Toronto Hamilton area and potentially other regions in Ontario, depending on capacity and vision in the future. You can follow us online at groundstory.ca or at uh, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram now at groundstoryon. My name is Jessa Gilo. I am the founder and project manager of Ground Story. I'm also the founder, president, and CEO of Arts Pond, a Tondar, which is the not for profit organization that is facilitating Ground Story uh, with very generous support from the Ontario Trillium Foundation. A little bit of background on Arts Pond and what we are trying to do. Our vision is that, in essence, is to become a national art services organization looking to support systemic change for small independent uh, creators and producers, so both artists and arts professionals across all disciplines in arts and culture. Uh, starting here in Toronto and the greater Toronto Hamilton area, but hopefully over time uh, expanding to the national uh, milieu. We have, in essence, uh, two, well, we started out becoming trying to become a charitable venture platform or a shared charitable platform, which has many uh, logistic issues uh, to address before those can happen. Uh, we're now focusing on two major initiatives, which in many ways are both collective impact efforts. One in the cloud called Digital ASO is uh, bringing arts and technology leaders together uh, primarily in the Windsor to Quebec City uh, corridor, but looking to reach out uh, across Canada uh, to uh, promote digital literacy and innovation and greater collaboration around the creation of uh, digital platforms for the arts and culture sector. And then there's Ground Story that I'm going to be talking about in more detail now. In terms of some of the uh, early stage partners and participants that have registered to attend some of the, the first advisory and roundtable sessions, these are sort of a sampling of some of the organizations. So we have funders here, uh, representatives from funders like Ontario Arts Council and Toronto Arts Council. They are not funding this initiative, so this is not an official an endorsement from those arts councils. It's just that there are individuals from those organizations in attendance. However, this uh, initiative is funded by the Ontario Trillium Foundation. I would like to point out amongst all these great partners, uh, Rosny Theatre has been a really tremendous uh, support organization as, as we try to find additional sources of funding as a young not-for-profit and not yet a charity, we're not eligible for many uh, sources of funding, including Canada Council. We're not eligible to apply until August of this year after two years of operations, and we're not also eligible to apply for foundations. So we have a, a, a nice uh, partnership with Roseneath uh, to ap apply uh, through their organization to these funders to try to uh, find additional funding to, to, to maximize the, the support that uh, we have from Trillium and to grow what we can do. In terms of the agenda for today, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about, okay, where did this initiative come from? My own personal story of deciding to uh, put my hand up and uh, ask if people would like to take on this journey with me. And then we'll go into a little bit more detail about the vision, the process, and potential roles of community members and being involved at some point, either in the shorter term or in the long term. I'll uh, provide a quick summary of what some of the fundraising goals are currently for the stage one activities. And I'll talk about the research focus, which is a, a, a primary focus of stage one, is doing some research. And then there'll be uh, hopefully some time for, for Q&A at the end. So this is uh, where I live. Uh, this uh, building right here is part of the Queen, uh, in the Queen West Triangle, the Artscape Triangle Lofts. This was a, a screen grab from Google uh, before, actually before the park was done and before uh, 48 of Bell Street, this building was quite finished. Um, it's seen quite a lot of change since I moved here in 2000. And, I moved to Toronto in 2006. And this neighborhood has changed a lot, and I'm contributing to that change. Um, 
But taking a look at uh, when I moved to Toronto in 2006, uh, I came from uh, Bruce County up on Lake Huron, and then I lived in Vancouver, and I lived in Montreal as well. But every time I come to visit to Toronto or thinking about moving to Toronto, the place that I wanted to live was in Parkdale or in West Queen West, because the story up like for generations, like for almost 30 years up until that time, was that's where most of the artists were in, Canada, in Toronto. It was a place to live. Uh, so this study um, from, 2000 and, from 2010, doing a survey of 2006 census data, demonstrated that there were 22,300 artists in Toronto, more than the other city in Canada, and that the highest concentration of artists was indeed uh, as a percentage of the overall labor force, was indeed in Parkdale at 6% and West Queen West at 5.5%. Uh, and I moved to Toronto in, uh, in the fall of 2006, and I ended up moving to uh, the Jameson and Queen West area, so I moved right into Parkdale. Uh, also, not just only the highest concentration, but also among the lowest uh, average incomes for artists compared to the overall labor force for those neighborhoods was in Parkdale at $16,400 um, for uh, artists in that neighborhood. And this is um, a professional artists, not uh, amateur or uh, unprofessional artists. So moving into Toronto in 2006, one of the reasons I moved to Toronto was I couldn't afford to buy housing, and I wanted to buy housing in Vancouver. And I tried Montreal for two years, and I couldn't quite, uh, not, uh, not being uh, very uh, bilingual, I found it hard to, to find a home there. So I came to Toronto, and I moved to the Queen West Triangle, where I started looking at uh, moving to the Queen West Triangle, which is a, a revitalization effort started happening just when I moved to the city. Uh, rumors of that started happening. Uh, 48 Abel Street uh, right here was a artist hub for m many decades um, in an abandoned or over kind of, uh, underutilized uh, manufacturing space it became many artist studios. In fact, this is where that building was. Um, right here, and this is what the area looked like in 2007, just when I uh, was living down the street. And of course, the uh, West Side Lofts was one of the first uh, development plans for this, this neighborhood. And by 2016, uh, this is what the neighborhood has looked like. A lot of changes happened. I'm in the Red Beck building right down here on the second floor over on the other side of the building. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, on the ground floor in, in this area of all these buildings. There's been empty, I've moved here in 2010, 2011. Since that time, almost all the ground floor units, which are meant to be commercial spaces, have been vacant and underutilized, which has been very depressing uh, for the energy of the neighborhood. Uh, a park has been completed since this image, uh, which is helping a little bit. Uh, but it's been a bit of an interesting change to the neighborhood. And I now see myself, didn't think of myself at all when I came to Toronto. I wanted to have a home, but I now see myself as a gentrifier. I have contributed to displacing the long-term artist tenants that used to live and work out of uh, the 48 Abel building. Uh, I now have affordable housing or just barely affordable. I'm struggling to, to you know, make my pay mortgage payments and keep up with taxes and so on uh, with you know, uncertain um, work from year to year. Um, but ultimately, I'm a gentrifier. And, and realizing that about a year and a half ago to two years ago, I realized that I needed to do something. Um, and looking at the story of this neighborhood and how much it's changing, the building immediately next door to me uh, was also developed by Urban Core, which is uh, the, the developer that was responsible through a partnership with Artscape for my own building. The building immediately next door, after Urban Core went uh, bankrupt, uh, was taken over by a, the KSV Advisory, uh, an insolvent uh, restructuring business company. Um, and after about a year or so, they decided that in order to recoup their debt, they needed and would just have had justification to, in essence, double their rents. 
um, from sixteen fifty to thirty three hundred dollars. Um, that's almost a year ago now. Um, in April of two thousand seventeen is when this news came out with the intent of uh, doubling the rent in just a few months. Uh, and I heard that news, and it just feels like wow. I'm I'm living in Manhattan, in New York, or I'm living in San Francisco. Uh, to hear uh, a one-bedroom uh, rental apartment is thirty-three hundred dollars just is really kill, uh, just killed me. Uh, that something has to be done. I don't what I can do as an artist uh, and as an arts manager, but I needed to do something. Um, also looking, uh, trying to understand how my neighborhood has changed. I see it on the surface, uh, but trying to find some numbers. There's been some studies uh, published at the Toronto Star uh, looking at um, using census data and looking at change of neighborhood incomes. So in 2006, this is what the Queen West Triangle area where I live uh, looked like in terms of uh, average household incomes. By 2015, uh, it's 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 changed really significantly, uh, going from uh, actually quite a lot of uh, you know under 50k in the area to almost all over 70 and 85k, and and increasingly more 110k average household incomes in 2015. That same uh, article identified, uh, so basically what the study was saying is this is a gentrified area um, using uh, changes in household income as an, as an identifier to find gentrified areas. Um, the same study suggested that there are about 14 other areas that have been gentrified uh, across Toronto, including where I'm at, over in Leslieville, in uh, North St. Jamestown, up in Christie Pets, the Junction, and over in, in the Danforth. And how do we determine what, how do we map and determine what factors are contributing to gentrification is a really important question for me. Um, but this study basically looked at, okay, did the, how, did the average household income increase from the bottom 40th percentile to the top 60th percentile um, over that uh, time period. So I think there are many other things that we could look at, but that's what this study is based on. The same study uh, also looked at, okay, we have gentrified areas, but what areas are in the process of being gentrified? And this is a map of uh, dissemina dissemination areas with uh, average household income change with the areas in red being 50% and the areas in uh, yellow or in blue being either declines or, or no increase. So my area where I live is, is not quite 50%. Up at the junction we have 50%. Um, over on the side, uh, there's some quite a bit of 50 and 40%. But it's, it's happening basically all over the city for in many ways here. Uh, with 40, 35, 45% uh, change in household incomes. So this same study suggested that uh, 20, almost 21% of Toronto's um, household na uh, neighborhoods are showing evidence of gentrification. 768 designated areas or neighborhoods have uh, seen increases. But I question, okay, is this the only factor that we can use to identify change and how to prioritize what neighborhoods to focus on in terms of trying to respond? What are the untold social and cultural pre pressures that are happening in localized neighborhoods where you know, artists, they may have not been displaced, they're, 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 they're finding ways to remain there, but they're having to actually decrease the amount of uh, artistic output because they're spending more and more on rent. Uh, so they, the, the stories of displacement uh, may not be there yet, um, but you know, may be imminent. We don't really have a lot of sense of that. Um, and who in these areas is being displaced and where are they being displaced to? So in essence, what are the stories uh, that's happening on the ground in all of these uh, uh, problem areas seeing a lot of change in terms of household incomes?
And there's certainly been stories in the media around, particularly in the music world, with the loss of music venues. All, all this, These are all from early 2017, when I started uh, thinking very seriously about taking on this effort, uh, with Ron Sexsmith uh, saying that in doing an album as a uh, last song to a love song, to as a farewell to Toronto, um, the loss of several music uh, venues uh, in just a few months, seven of them, in fact, um, storefront theater not being able to retain their uh, storefront uh, space. And just in general, uh, Akin Collective has more recently lost their uh, several of their spaces uh, on Dufferin and elsewhere. So there's just a lot of pressure on both housing and on spaces of work for artists across the city. So I started asking, well, what can be done as an individual? What can I do? And it seems to me that um, cities have a history of granting developers a lot of power in creating spaces for a selected few that can afford uh, whatever the interests of developers are in terms of affordability and accessibility and kinds of services that they provide. But you know, artists and other community members can and must uh, be more active and more coordinated in challenging cities to build much more inclusive communities that are representative of the vitality and creativity and diversity of our communities. Um, I think we should not be allowing developers to have the say on where our communities are going and how we built. So all of that is, in essence, the, the starting point for me in deciding to take on Ground Story um, and seeing if I can rally a community around it. So a little bit about the vision of how I see the next year, year and a half uh, proceeding. Um, no one other than myself has contributed to this theory of change or a vision statement uh, at this point, but I put it out to the community as a challenge, and I see a lot of issues with it. Um, but as a starting point, it's uh, for discussion. I'm, I'm interested in it. With 75% of arts and culture workers in the Greater Toronto Ham to Hamilton area are satisfied with their shelter and spaces of work by 2030. Some of the problems with this, well, uh, by 2030 uh, frightens me. Uh, that's not very far away. And 75% of all arts and culture workers in the Greater Toronto Hamilton area is also very, very ambitious. Um, there's also, uh, in terms of satisfaction, well, what, what is that? Uh, what elements are critical to satisfaction for a visual artist, for a musician, for a touring artist that is not at home very often but needs a solid base for creating new work? What is the uh, relationship and satisfaction between both shelter and spaces of work? Um, is 75% by 2030 uh, deliverable? Is the current uh, baseline something like 5% of arts and culture workers in the region are satisfied? Or is it 50% say in film or 75% in film but only 2% or 5% or zero in, in performing arts? Like what are the differences in different neighborhoods across the GTHA but also in different communities? And what are the components that we can reasonably uh, evaluate over time as a collective impact effort, would these be reasonable measures that are both desirable and deliverable by the different partners that are at the table? So yeah, uh, I'm the the initial uh, proposal I'm trying to get is to uh, invite partners from Etobicoke and Brampton and North York and New York region, Scarborough, um, Mississauga, Hamilton, East and West Toronto, all over the region, because I think this issue is uh, reflected in all of those communities, uh, particularly in terms of you know, downtown Toronto artists being displaced to uh, other regions outside the downtown core. It, it coming up with a response, I think, is really critical to not stay in just downtown Toronto, but to connect to other communities across the whole region in order to come up with a viable response long term. So whether or not this, this effort with the, uh, the partners at the table and the amount of money that we can raise can reasonably address the whole GTHA or say, uh, decide that it is a priority to focus just on the Parkdale community or in Leslieville or in the Junction or just in Hamilton or whichever physical uh, geographic region, uh, that also has not been determined at this, at this stage. 
In terms of collective impact, uh, the, the framework from social innovation is, in essence, is to try to bring as many uh, implicated uh, partners, individuals and organizations that have an interest in, the, uh, in this specific issue and are also impacted by it uh, to collaborate intentionally over a very long period of time. I'm looking at 10 years, uh, but this stage one is really just a year and a half. Um, with five conditions uh, in terms of uh, structuring uh, expectations of the collaboration, uh, bringing together not-for-profit businesses, uh, funders, governments, and impacted uh, residents and citizens. Um, there's the common agenda where participating organizations work towards a common goal and a shared theory of change. So I've proposed one, and now we have to uh, come up with an, what we are going to actually attempt um, shared measurement is really important in, in to track uh, progress on that theory of change, mutual reinforcing activities, commu uh, continuous communication, also very important, and Arts Pond is suggesting to become the backbone support to provide dedicated support and coordination amongst all the partners. So how I'm suggesting, I mentioned 10 years or 8 to 10 years. So stage one, this is taken exactly from the Ontario Trillium uh, Collective Impact Framework of, in essence, uh, defining the impact, organizing a little bit better for that impact, and then delivering it over an 8 to 10 year timeline. So we're in stage one right now. The process that we're looking at uh, for stage one, and actually not looking at, the process that we are activating for stage one uh, is to cultivate both steering and advisory committees uh, to uh, bring as many cross-sectoral partners together uh, to build trusting relationships between those partners uh, and to find means and methods to which uh, to sustain a collaboration long term. Um, to identify uh, other cross-sectoral champions that uh, should be at the table and can help rally greater community interest and investment in the effort long term, uh, to define an effective governance and communication structure to facilitate that trust and to facilitate collaboration, to define the scope of the problem. So are we going to try to address the whole GTHA or specific neighborhoods and through what kind of common agenda theory of change uh, are we going to try to address that? And uh, I'm hoping to actually uh, do some very preliminary pressure testing of some potential solutions to to because this is, issue is very urgent. I'm um, hoping to actually, in this first year, do some preliminary pressure testing of some solutions in the sector. I don't know what those are, are going to be just yet, but uh, the goal of the collaborations thus far is to try to have some initial, um, not just meetings, but to try to uh, test some things in the sector. Uh, so what we're actually doing to start off is uh, planning semi-monthly, I'm calling them advisory uh, committee, not steering committee meetings to start because I don't want to scare people away. Um, so I'm asking people to come in as advisors to contribute in whatever way they can and out of those meetings uh, over the next year to identify, okay, who is a, a good advisor in terms of providing feedback and support long-term for the direction of the effort, but also who is implicated in providing the leadership and governance of the actual initiative longer term, so the steering committee. So I'm calling in an advisory committee sessions at the moment in order to try to keep the uh, pressure down a little bit on people and invite a wider cross-section. I'm trying, to, uh, working with uh, many lassos uh, and local community organizations to present uh, advisory committee sessions semi-monthly, basically in every region that I can try to touch, in both uh, east and west and central downtown Toronto, uh, North York and the York region, Hamilton, Burlington, Etobicoke, Mississauga, uh, Brampton and, Maso and um, Scarborough are, are not confirmed, but I have had uh, quite a few conversations with uh, members in those community and they've expressed interest. Uh, I also, as a bit 
uh, haphazardly throw out there uh, possibilities of other communities uh, outside the GTHA, including from Milton and Oshawa, Guelph, Cambridge, Kitchener, Waterloo, Ottawa, Kingston, and so on. And I've been talking to people in Vancouver, Montreal, much longer term thinking that uh, as Toronto artists get displaced uh, even further afield from the GTHA, there may be um, uh, a benefit from being better connected to other communities outside the GTHA in this focus. So I'm doing quite a bit of outreach outside of the GTHA just to inform them that these uh, this activity is happening. Uh, I don't think we'll be doing actual advisory committee meetings in these session in those communities, but uh, I'm starting conversations at the very least. So that's where a lot of the community outreach is coming at, coming in. Try to uh, make people aware of this initiative. Um, by uh, spring 2019, I hope to share uh, the lessons from all the advisory sessions as well as the, uh, we're doing, uh, in addition to two advisory sessions, we're doing public outreach uh, roundtables for arts and culture workers that aren't necessarily going to be advisors or community, um, community leaders in this effort, but want to have an opportunity to share their stories and how they're being impacted. Um, we'll be uh, publishing a report on all of that activity uh, with recommendations for stage two. We're also doing a um, very uh, exhaustive international literature review. I have about 50 volunteers that are helping me, and I'm working with uh, Humber College to hopefully raise some funding through, through their Cultivate program to extend that work. Um, so we hope to intend, we don't hope, we intend to publish an annotated bibliography with at least 100 prioritized sources uh, having detailed uh, annotations, but we'll see how many we can actually do. Um, also to facilitate greater communication with both uh, community um, uh, steering committee and advisory committee members, uh, but also with the greater community. Uh, we're setting up an e-list that anyone can contribute to. Uh, you just have to subscribe, um, and by having access to that e-list, you can also have access to our core online contact collaboration site through Office 365 to gain access to work-in-progress meeting notes and reports and so on, and the research. Um, so you can kind of be a fly on the wall as a very open source approach to this effort, uh, be a fly on the wall on our project if not actively involved. So I mentioned this, the system landscape applied research with the literature review. So the, the roundtables are all part of that. Uh, we've applied for $100,000 from Canada Council to uh, try to do uh, focus groups regionally and uh, potentially provincially, as well as province-wide uh, surveys with uh, general public and arts and, in, arts and culture industry workers to try to establish a baseline around the theory of change that I've proposed what are the elements of satisfaction in shelter and space in the GTHA in different neighborhoods and different communities and different disciplines? And what level of risk are artists? Um, what level of risk are artists and arts professionals uh, at of being displaced or being gentrified? And what are the general public perceptions of artists uh, as being either instigators of community revitalization or uh, gentrification? So uh, our part, major partners on the applied research is Hill Strategies Research and Humber College, all contingent upon the, the funding. Our first proposal to Canada Council uh, submitted in December was unsuccessful, but we resubmitted it uh, uh, this week uh, for the next Don Valley. So I'm really hopeful that starting in August or in September, uh, we can do quite a significant applied research effort. So this is a quick overview on, on the, the, the stage one activities in terms of, of a schedule. Um, stage 1A is in essence what has uh, been funded by the Ontario Trillium Foundation uh, with uh, stage 1B being Canada Council applied research and uh, additional reports and pressure testing of preliminary solutions um, uh, con is contingent upon Canada Council funding. Uh, so stage 1A uh, is the literature review, uh, the initial advisory committee sessions, and um, public uh, roundtables, and a preliminary uh, mid-cycle evaluation report, all to be done um, ideally by the end of October, uh, with then Canada Council uh, research continuing and uh, pressure testing going into March of 2019. 
so you all know about the, you both know about the uh, in upcoming events. Um, so I, in uh, Hamilton and in Toronto, the in essence are uh, four hour meetings with the first half being uh, the advisory session and then the second half uh, being a um, arts and culture worker round table. At later sessions, we'll have uh, general public uh, roundtables, um, but the, the roundtables currently are being focused at arts and culture workers to capture their stories, uh, in essence as research, but also as a rallying cry to try to get artists to not only complain about uh, what their situation is, but potentially to find some solutions collaboratively or to provide greater moral support, uh, greater community support to the challenges that we have and find greater collaboration. So the community roles uh, to be involved at, a, at the, the easiest level is to uh, provide a public statement or testimonial of support or lend your name as maybe not as, a, as an actual endorsement, but uh, as maybe endorsement isn't the right word, but just that uh, some kind of support statement to, to say that Grand Story is a needed effort in the community. Uh, it may not be the right answer, but we agree that something ha something like this it needs to happen, and uh, there isn't anything else happening. So, uh, you know, give whatever level of endorsement you are able to provide uh, to help us um, connect greater to community leaders and to demonstrate that there is true cross sectoral support of the kind of conversations that we're trying to uh, encourage. Um, the next level up beyond just providing your name or, or testimonials, anonymous, anonymous testimonies of support would be to, to become an outreach or a community outreach advocate to help share our vision and activities with diverse communities. Um, very flexible commitment to whenever you have time, um, but uh, basically to help us spread the word. Um, the next steps up are various levels of, of representation to make sure that um, whenever you have time um, to provide feedback and reflections on our work to make sure that we are engaging and representing the needs and interests of diverse communities, whether it is arts and culture workers that are deeply impacted um, by this issue or represent very diverse communities, uh, disadvantaged, racialized communities like LGBTQ communities or uh, black or brown, uh, all kinds of different uh, indigenous communities and so on. In fact, we have uh, indigenous community representative call out, uh, all with flexible commitment to time and interest. Other um, Communities are uh, providing feedback or contributing to the applied research effort, particularly the literature review. But as focus groups and the, uh, the surveys are designed to provide feedback to make sure that we're asking the right kinds of questions. Um, so we'll be asking for research committee members to you know, uh, help us test the, the first uh, focus group questions and the first surveys before they are disseminated widely across Ontario. Um, the advisory committee have talked a little bit about, uh, I'm trying to target about, if I'm, if ground stories ultimately to try to address the whole GTHA, I think we probably need about uh, 400 advisors or 75 to 100 advisors in each major community with about 10 or 20 from each major industry across the GTHA contributing whatever feedback they can on the mandate, the scope, the direction, practices, structures that are being developed for this effort to make sure it's responsive to their interests, um, all flexible to their commitment. But you know, I think this is one of the most complex issues I've ever dreamed to uh, try to address. And I, I, I don't think it can be done uh, with just you know, 50 or 100 people. I think it needs a very large uh, group of people. But the actual steering committee is much smaller. I'm trying to target a working, uh, an active working group of about 40 members um, with a minimum one-year commitment for now. But you know, as the effort, uh, the scope, and the actual theory of change, common agenda is identified to be looking at much longer uh, uh, term commitments. But for now, it's a one-year commitment with minimum attendance at 50% of all meetings. And that can be a challenge as we move to different uh, geographic regions around the around the um, GTHA, uh, but we'll have both in-person and uh, webinar meetings. So if you can't uh, travel to Hamilton, you can uh, attend those meetings electronically. 
uh, with the, the purpose of the steering committee to contribute to the, the scope, direction, governing structures, common agenda, theory of change, and other strategies and priorities uh, for this effort uh, longer term. We also need venue hosts for space with potentially up to 100 people for the, the advisory committee sessions and for the public roundtables. And we have fu uh, funding available to, to pay for, for that space, but uh, in kind is always welcome. Um, the fundraising committee is to help us with our fundraising efforts, either providing feedback or actually contributing to uh, planning special events or writing grants or uh, being uh, partners on applications and so on. Uh, the target is actually now uh, $325,000, not 250000 This is a bit of an older slide. Um, but these are the proposals that have either been submitted or are in the works. The, the only one, in fact, that has not been submitted at this stage is the J.W. McConnell Foundation in a WEAVE program, and we've been talking to them, and they've expressed interest in, in our work. So um, it may not be the right time for that funding, but we're hopeful that uh, we'll have a, at least this uh, level of funding for the Stage 1 A and B activities. Okay, so a little bit more to do. Uh, the research questions, as I mentioned, the focus of, of stage one is to try to establish a baseline of understanding of this issue, um, how it's being, um, how artists and, and arts professionals are being impacted, and what is happening in other communities around the world that we might potentially learn, not as recipes, but more as values, um, to help us think better and more uh, profoundly about our own communities and how we might collaborate together. So some of the main research questions for the lit review, the literature review in particular, are what are the roles of arts, of artists and arts and culture workers in gentrification and displacement? What are the public perceptions of artists for the same? Um, in San Francisco, in LA, in New York, there's a whole movement uh, called art washing where community members are complaining about art galleries moving into low income neighborhoods, whether it's in the US, Spanish communities, um, uh, Latino, Mexican communities uh, that have been traditionally low income, galleries are moving in and they see it as the wedge of uh, gentrification for that area and they've been protesting very actively on the change. So is that the case here in our communities? We tend to not protest as much, although in Hamilton there's been some quite active uh, destructive protests uh, of apparently gentrification. Um, but what are the perceptions here in Canada of artists uh, in terms of you know, who's to blame for this issue? Uh, so. If artists are not to blame, uh, what are the other key drivers of gentrification and how can artists um, you know, help contribute to responding to those drivers? We may not actually be responsible, but can we uh, contribute in some way? Where are vulnerable artists currently living and working and what challenges are they having in accessing affordable shelter and spaces of work? Where are they, when they are being displaced, where are they being displaced to and how are those communities that they are being displaced to responding? Uh, there are many uh, communities across Ontario that have had uh, FedDev um, funding to create cultural plans that are now sitting on the shelf. Uh, and if we have evidence to suggest that you know artists are moving to Barrie and Aurelia and uh, Prince Edward County and London and Windsor and so on, Kitchener-Waterloo, um, are those communities ready to take an influx of, of artists over the next decade or so? What are artists doing? What kind of sacrifices are artists uh, taking on to remain in their communities now? What are the elements of satisfaction for shelters and spaces of work and the relationship between the two? Um, so if you're really happy with your shelter, but your studio and your shelter is in Hamilton, but your studio is in, say, Mississauga, then you're not going to be satisfied with either because you're going to spend way too much time traveling. So what's the relationship between the two? What range of tools, policies, and interventions, so looking at politics uh, primarily, um, are working and not working in the sector, and how are artists implicated in trying to help those policies be better uh, uh, designed uh, to work in the community? What key issues need resources for deeper research? Uh, and this is where I think the federal government and other funders can come in once we are identified where are the major gaps in evidence 
um, where can those resources be uh, put to for future uh, uh, data collection and evaluation? And what methods are we going to use uh, to gather all of this? The major themes for the research are the roots, ripple effects, and responses to gentrification. So I call them my three R's. Um, in terms of the roots, what are the drivers and causes of gentrification in different regions and the role of the arts uh, for the same? Uh, what are the relationships between social, cultural, economic, political, and geographic fa factors? Uh, are they the same in different uh, geographic regions, whether it's Davenport, where I live, across Toronto, Hamilton, across the GTHA, or Ontario? Is this effort going to start looking at the rest of Canada? And as we look at uh, sharing our learnings, are there any implications for other cities around the world, as this is increasingly a global, a global issue? Uh, uh, ripple effects. What are the positive and adverse ripple effects of gentrification around neighborhood revitalization, social spatial displacement, loss of affordable housing and spaces, cultural spaces of work and of uh, community engagement, uh, greater in inequality and polarization of income, uh, but also of, soci of societal cultural accessibility and equality. Uh, responses. What are the responses and potential solutions to gentrification? So. Uh, what, are, what kind of protests are happening? What kind of mitigation efforts or mapping of, of gentrification is happening uh, around the world and, and locally? Uh, the, in the research, we're also finding uh, about predicting uh, or preserving uh, different regions as a response to gentrification. Uh, equitable urban development or inclusionary zoning policies, uh, developing community land trusts, uh, cooperative housing, economic incentives so artists can better afford to remain where they are if we can't actually prevent them from being displaced, then maybe we can help them become much more better stewards of their, of their social and economic uh, careers and capacities so that they can afford to stay where they are. Also looking at other collective impact efforts and what, uh, particularly around housing and poverty uh, and income precarity, uh, what, me, what we might learn from those efforts. Uh, I have a few slides uh, that I can just quickly show um, from some research that I had prioritized back in the fall. So these are older ones. There are many, many more uh, now available on our Facebook group. Um, also on our website as I published the whole uh, working bibliography. But these are some that were very interesting to me when I was deciding to actually take this effort on. Uh, the Canadian Centre for Economic Analysis brought about a hundred disparate uh, data sources together that had previously not been connected to identify 40 main, dry, uh, uh, 40 main causes and their correlations to 10 uh, policy approaches that are causing unaffordability of housing uh, in the GTHA. And this was published in May 2017, and I decided to actually do this effort in May of 2017. Um, and this was one of the first things I read and realized, oh, okay, if, if this is possible, we may have to bring all kinds of uh, unassociated um, data types together in the future for our research, but uh, we can potentially find, find the root causes. Um, in terms of mapping around the world uh, in the United States, there's uh, looking at uh, mapping neighborhood change and gentrification susceptibility in the uh, Southern California, LA, San Francisco uh, corridor. Um, there's also uh, in Portland, Oregon, they've been mapping gentrification in their areas. Uh, there's been studies about mitigating gentrification out of Denver and out of uh, multiple regions in uh, the United States uh, through the Urban Institute, looking at case studies of local efforts to mitigate, so not actually stop, but try to reduce the impacts. Uh, here in Toronto and then throughout Canada, there's uh, DUFT has been a very active for some time. Um, the neighborhood change uh, research effort around mapping the roots and ripples of neighborhood change and in inequality, polarization and uh, of income and poverty. Uh, so there's quite a big uh, resource there in terms of uh, knowledge, knowledge base. Uh, in communities that are finding the... Um, kind of exact opposite of gentrification, uh, but ghettoization, um, they're looking at uh, creating maps to preserve where their cultural uh, 
sources are before they are lost because they can't afford to uh, because the regions are economically depressed, uh, they can't afford to, you know, the buildings are falling apart or wherever. Um, they're trying to uh, map where their cultural resources are and where they're moving over time um, to better understand the strengths of their cultural assets as a means to you know, try to position them as a creative city and hopefully re revitalize in the longer term. Um, but we could uh, definitely look at uh, mapping our cultural assets a little bit better and tracking how they change uh, in terms of, of where they are um, over time to better track the impacts of gentrification. Uh, Carl Grodash's work um, mapping correlations between different disciplines, uh, fine arts, performing arts, media arts, and so on, uh, to both gentrification and uh, displacement has been really profound for me uh, in having a much more fine level of detail and understanding of this issue. Um, for many years, it's been you know uh, creative class uh, groupings of different disciplines in the arts, along with uh, you know computer programmers and architects and so on and grouping them all as one big class in uh, revitalization and not having a big understanding of how they each individually do or do not contribute to uh, both gentrification and displacement in uh, different regions. And this study of, of uh, I believe it was 50 uh, U.S. major metropolitan areas suggested that there were negative correlations between uh, gentrification and displacement for, for example, performing arts, uh, whereas there was a um, small correlation, positive correlation between uh, media arts and uh, gentrification and displacement. Uh, there's lots of work happening around tax policy, uh, foreign buyers tax, and most recently here in Toronto, the property tax reduction for cultural hubs with 50%. Uh, and globally, there's quite a bit of work happening uh, with the World Cities Cultural Forum and this one study that has, uh, that's talking about the impact of artists on cultural urban development uh, across Europe. So that's all I have uh, for today. I have 10 minutes um, to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, let's...